Please welcome to the stage Axios Markets reporter Courtney Brown. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Axios News Shapers event. This morning, we're going to be talking about economic opportunity in the U.S. We've just had a very pivotal midterms election. Inflation rates are cooling, but they're still very high. Um, experts say there could be a recession on the horizon. And so how do all of these things impact the economic and financial well-being of Americans? That's the question we're hoping to answer today. We're also hoping to get some solutions, if we can. Uh, before we begin today's event, I want to thank our sponsor, Bank of America. And we hope everyone watching today will follow along on Twitter using the hashtag Axios Events. Um, and now let's get started. Our first guest is the president and CEO of the National Bankers Association. Please welcome Nicole Elam. All right, how are you? I'm good, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Okay, so you are the head of the National Bankers Association, the NBA, not mm -hmm. to be confused with not the other NBA. Not to be confused with the other NBA. Um, so you represent members who are minority depository institutions, MDIs, mm -hmm. community development financial in institutions, CDFIs, mm -hmm. a lot of acronyms. Um, so why do, these, why do these institutions, these banks, why do they matter? What do they do for the communities that they support? Yeah, that's a great question. So minority owned and operated banks matter because they're key to helping close the racial wealth gap. It's really hard to build wealth if you don't have access to financial services. It's how we save for the future, buy a house, build a business. And these banks have a well-established track record of saying yes when others are saying no. And it's no surprise, really, when you think about the history of these banks, these are banks that were born out of racism because black, brown, and immigrant communities could not go to mainstream financial institutions for their banking services. And so they are significant providers of mortgages and small business loan in these communities of color. Okay. So I wrote a story in November of 2019, almost three years to the day, about mm -hmm. how minority-owned institutions were shrinking. There are yeah. fewer and fewer of them. Yeah. And because I have nothing else better to do, I went on the FDIC's website, <laughs> your regulator, or your members' regulators, uh -huh. and I looked at the number of banks that there are. It looks yeah. like it peaked in 2008 mm -hmm. at 215 of these mm -hmm. uh, financial institutions. And basically, if you chart it, it's down and to yeah. the right. Mm -hmm. And it looks like as of this year, as of Q2, there are 144. Yep. I mean, that's out of 4,800 commercially insured banks. Yep. So what's happening there? Why are there so few? And you know, you talk about how these institutions are the ones to say yes when others say no. Yeah. So yeah. what does that mean for, for yeah. you know, people in the community? For those communities. So I mean, the reality of it is, is that there is a downward decline, right? When you think about the peak, and I talk a lot about black banks, even though we represent all minority owned and operated banks, because they've experienced the most decline. At the peak, there were 134 black banks. Today, there are only 19. And so you've seen this huge decline across the banking industry. So there's been a 40% decline since the 2008 financial crisis. There's been a 50% decline in community banks and MDIs and a 60% decline in black banks. And there's a number of reasons why, but one of the biggest reasons is around access to capital. These banks have been historically undercapitalized. They've been doing more with less, but it's because they have less capital. When there's an economic downturn, it's more likely that they don't have the capital that they need to withstand. And so you've seen closures. Now, the good news is, is that even though the number has declined, you're, ask, you're seeing the asset size grow. And so over the last couple of years, you've seen the asset size of these banks grow by 150%. So some of them have grown two, three, four X. And that affects how much they can ultimately it does. lend out to people, it does. right? Exactly. So speaking of capital, um, in 2020, uh, George Floyd was murdered. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of uh, movement and talk in corporate America on doing a bunch of things to help yeah. close the racial wealth gap. And one of the things that they talked about was, you know, companies like Netflix and J.P. Mm -hmm. and Morgan. They pledged to invest in financial institutions that support minority communities. Um, 
So what's happened since then? Yeah. Um, have these commitments made a difference for your members as far as you can tell? I assume they're, they, some of them at least, have been on the receiving end of this capital. Yeah. So there were a lot of headlines, right? And MDIs were really the beneficiary of it because they were seen for two important reasons. One, to help the communities that were hardest hit by the pandemic bounce back and recover. But two, they were also seen as key to helping people meet their racial equity commitments, key to helping close the racial wealth gap. And so you saw all of the headlines. And I would see, say that there was commitments in four big ways. The first was around capital. So you saw a lot of Wall Street banks make capital commitments to these banks. The second was around deposits, and that's where you saw the Netflix headlines and other major corporations make deposits in these banks. The third was around business opportunities. So this idea of who do you bank with and ensuring that you're using uh, minority banks for your banking business. A great example is the Atlanta Hawks. Last year, when they wanted to refinance their training facility, they used a consortium of 10 black banks to do that. And then the last is around tech and talent. We know that technology drives everything that we do, but it's really cost prohibitive for community banks. And so you've seen a lot of corporations step up in the areas of tech and talent to make sure that these community banks have what they need. Now the key is what now, right? So you saw the headlines. And what we've seen is that those banks that have really made a commitment beyond a headline, they are the ones that are getting further faster, the ones that maybe have a dedicated resource. It's not something that is separate within their DEI initiative, but it's something that's been embedded within the way that they do business. It's not just within their corporate philanthropic bucket, but it's they're changing the way that they are uh, working with these banks to make sure that they actually have a seat at the table. So, you know. There's still more work to be done, but I am encouraged because we've seen more, particularly of the big banks, hire uh, folks that are specific to MDIs. So you said there were a lot of headlines. There were a lot of headlines. Yeah. There are not so many headlines right now at mm -hmm. all, actually. Mm -hmm. So do you think that corporate America has moved on from this initiative to um, help close the racial, uh, the racial wealth gap? Yeah, I think that um, corporate America is like Americans, right? We, we can easily divert our attention to something else. And so I think that's why it's so important to take advantage of this moment where it was a big issue to make systemic changes, to not just say, don't write us a philanthropic check, but change who you're making deposits in, change the businesses and banks that you're working with. And so uh, that's what we've been spending a lot of time because we know that this moment will pass. I'd like to think otherwise, but we've seen these cycles before. And so we've been focused on systemic changes. So your last employer was JP Morgan, which when you think about huge announcements out yeah. of corporate America, that was a really eye-popping number. They announced $30 billion uh, in various commitments mm -hmm. uh, to help things uh, related to racial equity over five years. So, you know, there's a lot of skepticism around yeah. that announcement. Um, Emily Flitter at the New York Times has done some really great reporting on this. And I'm wondering, um, you know, what you think about what JP Morgan announced. I'm asking you because that was your employer and you were actually involved yeah. in, um, you know, helping push this announcement out, possibly help shape it. Um, so what do you think? Is there should we be skeptical about what they announced? Do you think it will actually make a difference? Yeah, so I think there was a lot of skepticism because what you saw were um, corporations and big banks make announcements of what they were already doing. So they basically rolled up everything that they were doing and they rebranded it as a racial equity commitment. While I was at J.P. Morgan Chase, what I can say is that they were very intentional about going out to the organizations, to the experts that were already working in these areas to ask them, what's the best way to impact home ownership? What's the best way to impact impact minority owned and operated small businesses? What's the best way for us to increase and improve the financial health of underserved communities? And so we, we looked at 50 different organizations and experts that we were constantly asking those questions around. And so that's why it took a lot of time for them to make that announcement because they did a lot of the work asking experts. And so that was part of my responsibility. I had a contingency of organizations that I was working with, getting their feedback, trying to define and refine what it is that we should be doing. And so I think um, what we've now seen them do is take it outside of philanthropy, which is when I started there four or five years ago, a lot of the work was in philanthropy to actually move it to something that's within their lines of business and actually make sure that it's a part of their public policy agenda as well. And so I think when you have business, philanthropy, and policy, when you see those three commitments coming aligned within an organization, you can see real change. You wrote a op-ed, an op-ed mm -hmm. um, earlier this fall. The headline was, big banks and regulators do more to close the racial gap. So what, you know, we talked about the private sector. Yeah. I mean, what would you like the public sector to do? 
So I think there are a lot of things that the public sector can do. The, the first is who do you bank with, right? So um, public sector, you can make deposits in these organizations. We're also thinking about the infrastructure law, right? There are a lot of dollars that are coming down, not to just rebuild bridges and roads, but also it's an opportunity to be equitable. So making sure that you're including minority owned and operated banks in the financing of these public projects. Climate, there's a lot of climate dollars coming down the pipe. Are you ensuring that these banks are really participating in climate finance opportunities. Are, you, are, you, are they not at the table? So I think that there are a lot of things that the government can do in terms of deposits, in terms of the financing of public projects, uh, in terms of TA, technical assistance, that they can do to support these banks. And I would also say, lastly, examination process is a huge area that there's more that regulators can do. Oftentimes, examiners don't understand the uniquenesses of minority-owned and operated banks and who they serve. And so when you think about, oh, I'm comparing this bank to this bank, these banks may not be peers, right. because peers is not about asset size. Peers also has to do with the demographics that you serve. And so I think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done when you're thinking about the examiners and the examination process. Um, you're a member of um, the Treasury Advisory Committee on Racial Equity, T. Aker. That's yeah, T. Aker. OK, T. <laughs> Aker. Um, I think the goal is to figure out how to narrow right. racial um, inequity. So I know it's early. I know mm -hmm. this is a fairly new advisory committee. But I mean, what are you, what type of, type of impact are are you hoping that this committee will have? Well, one thing that I can say is that the committee is comprised of folks who are coming in with a commitment towards this and whatever their capacity is. And so folks came in on day one with thoughts about things that Treasury can do better, differently, things that they're doing that maybe you're there, I understand your intent, but the way that it works, it's actually not going to move the dial. Uh, thinking about policy changes. And so I will say that folks are coming in with their perspectives of the, of the industries that they represent about the things that Treasury can do. And I I think Treasury's commitment is really aligned with this administration to focus on equity, and Treasury is no exception. Uh, they are really trying to think through how can we bolster and really inform our racial equity efforts and what can we do better and differently. And so we've been thinking about all those things, and we're starting to have those conversations about when we look back a year from now, what do we want to say is different? Really quickly, um, your members, they are banks. They yes. have a very unique lens on what's happening in the economy right now. Before we go, can you just tell me what are you hearing from them in terms of how the economy is doing, how the businesses they support are doing, um, and how they've recovered from the pandemic? I know that was three yeah. questions, <laughs> but if you, if you can answer. We'll hit the high points. Yeah. So you know, we all know that whenever there's an economic downturn, the communities that our banks serve are the hardest hit. And so we want to be well positioned to serve them. I think what's different about this economic downturn from prior is that our banks actually have the capital that they need to continue to do lending in these communities, to continue to ensure that they have what they need. So we know that it's gonna be a tough environment. Uh, we know that our, that our communities are gonna be hardest hit. This isn't new for us, it may be new for other people. We are used to doing more with less, and so we're gonna to continue to lend, and we're gonna continue to make sure that these communities don't just have the capital that they need, but they have the coaching that they need to be capital ready and mortgage ready, and to have everything that they need to be successful in this economic downturn. Turn. Okay, so we'll have to leave it there. We're out of time. Thank you so much, Nicole, for joining Axios. Thank you News for Shapers. having me. Okay. Introducing our view from the top moderator and Axios publisher, Nicholas Johnson. much uh, all of you for joining us today on what feels like the first day of winter um, in Washington. Uh, I'm very grateful for all of you coming out and especially grateful uh, for our partner today, Bank of America. Nothing that we do uh, at Axios from having delicious snacks and events and coffee like this or to the investments that we make uh, in journalism would be, possible, would be possible without our partners. So a huge thanks to Bank of America, our sponsor today. Now I want to welcome to the stage for a view from the top segment, uh, Bank of America's Managing Director for ESG Capital Deployment, Dan LaTondra. Dan, come on up. Welcome, Dan. Uh, one of my favorite parts of these segments is I get to do a lot of them with bankers, and I love talking to bankers because they have big picture views of the economy. So from your seat at one of America's largest banks, what do you see uh, in the macroeconomic environment, both short term into the holidays and for 2023? Economic forecasting. I'm not Piece sure. of cake. We'll write it down and we'll come back in six months and see how you did. I'm not sure <laughs> I'm brave enough necessarily to start there, but uh, let's start with just some, some data. The 
preponderance of data clearly shows a slowing economically. Um, whether you look at uh, economic growth, employment, consumer spending, the strongest numbers, they're all in the rearview mirror. When you look forward, there's a slowing. Combine that with the highest interest rates we've seen in 15 years, right. and you go into 2023 with a significant break, slowing. But from my perspective, given my role, which is focusing on financing and capital deployment in our nation's poorest communities, most underserved communities, we're clearly seeing some challenges as we go into 2023. If you think of community development finance, the three pillars, affordable housing, small business, and nonprofit social service organizations, all three of them are facing significant challenges. But let's just highlight one, perhaps, affordable housing. If you look back one year ago at the affordable rental housing projects that Bank of America financed, all are in construction, they're doing well. But one year later today, less than half of those projects would pencil out today. Right. The combination of uh, higher construction costs and materials combined with higher interest rates mean that most of those would not pencil out or finance without significant... So it sounds property. like the macroeconomic trends that are at the headlines right now, inflation, interest rates are... I think like that, at, at, at your, in, your, in your line of work in community development financial institutions, like that, you're at the, the knife edge of that, I feel like, where it hits most. It affects every place, but particularly in low-income communities. Well, then let's deep, dig deeper into CDFIs, which you see. Like, how do you see the role in, like, when a rising tide is lifting all boats, it's probably a lot easier. But when you talk about these macro trends, which are somewhat worrisome, what is the role you feel like those institutions can play in at least mitigating uh, a downturn like that? Sure. And I, and I think that's exactly the, the point. CDFIs, I think, are at their best and most valuable during times of economic stress. And it's why I think we are hearing a lot more about CDFIs. I mean, look at the last two and a half years. Uh, global health catastrophe, economic dislocation and isolation. CDFIs are at their best for that. Largely because of the unique position that CDFIs play. If you think of what a CDFI is, uh, it's a small, locally focused, usually nonprofit finance company or loan fund, making loans to uh, businesses, to individuals, real estate projects that mainstream financial institutions cannot on a profitable basis. CDFIs are in a unique position to do that. In part, if you think about it, uh, most of these um, loans are viewed as higher risk, mm -hmm. perceived higher risk. It may be a 5% or 10% uh, likelihood of uh, charge off or, or loss. You can't make loans in that scenario on a for-profit basis. But you and I would both want to see some of that financing happen. So if you mix a little bit of philanthropy together with a lot of private sector capital together, you can make financing happen that you and I would want to see happen, but can't be done on a few, purely for a profit basis. That's right. really the role that CDFIs can play. And that can be a bulwark against exacerbated downturns in those kinds of communities. Yes, and also as a quick intervention. One of the things about CDFIs is that they are nimble organizations because they are small. Um, they're helpful both in economic downturns and in local responses. When you're talking about weather-related disasters, hurricanes, storms, et cetera, CDFIs can, can design quick interventions this, in loans. This almost seems like a, a, a negative economic, economic environment that's an opportunity when traditional capital would pull out of those because of economic headwinds and would move even farther away from risky investments. It's CDFIs that are what's left. Right? Well, I don't know if they economic, they'd pull out, but I'd say CDFIs run towards it. I often think of CDFIs as financial first responders. They'll go in where the understanding of risk is not known or the perceived higher risk demonstrate what works, what doesn't, and then mainstream financial institutions can bring in large amounts of capital after that. Right. So there's probably a reason we're having this conversation in Washington. Like CDFIs, you're not alone in this. There's a lot of help, like you said, from philanthropic organizations. There's probably a lot of government um, uh, involvement in this. What, needs, what, what are you looking for as far as challenges that you need help addressing? Or like, who, who can help make this more impactful? I think especially for the audience here, which is probably a very specific audience that is very thinking about this from a Washington-centric point of view. So I think there are a number of things we can do to help CDFIs do more of what they do best. I think the first is awareness. 
while more people are talking about CDFIs than ever before, they are still not known on a widespread basis. There are over uh, 1,300 CDFIs. They operate in every one of the 50 states, every one of the 70 largest municipalities, and they are not well known from a name or a brand name perspective. But I would say that if you are a bank looking to partner and extend your reach, if you are a philanthropic organization looking to create some social change, if you are a government agency looking to serve communities better, CDFIs are the organizations that can serve and help you do that. But we've got to get the word out about specific CDFIs and the different roles that they can provide, one. Two, from a capital perspective, CDFIs need both philanthropic support, yes, but they need investment capital. The Bank of America, we've got a $2 billion portfolio invested into more than 250 CDFIs, and we've been doing it for 30 years. We can tell you it's good business. We get those investments and loans repaid. CDFIs are doing good and then are repaying us. It's good business. We need more investors alongside to support CDFIs. So this is almost seems like a sales job, a little, not to be glib about it, but like, do you have a sense of like, even in the communities that can benefit from this, there needs to be more education as far as like, these are organizations that can, this, that can help this. Yes. Like on both sides of this coin, within these communities and in the broader capital market structure, that this is a, an investment vehicle that is not just good for communities, but good business. Yes. Look, I, 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 we've been watching what CDFIs can do for 30 years, and they've convinced us that they are under leveraged and un underutilized resources. So yes, in that instance, I'm certainly a, a salesman for CDFIs and I'd like to see more organizations and institutions helping them. We right. need that. How can folks in this town help? This is maybe a little bit of a political question. I promised you I'm not gonna ask you to make midterm analysis, but uh, what, what can Washington, maybe specifically Congress do as far as helping on those accounts? Are there regulatory things, are there policy things, or just merely just continue to spread the good word? So look, I think, um, that there are a number of things that CDFIs uh, need. The good news is um, uh, the U.S. Department of Treasury CDFI fund continues to see the good role that CDFIs do and provide more and more funding, and we need more of that on a going forward basis. The CDFI fund within the U.S. Department of Treasury has been a strong advocate. We can do more. We're also coming out later this week with a policy paper that will go through the tactics that, you, that you're describing on a lower basis beyond just awareness and capital, which are the two I want to emphasize here. We're coming out and giving some more specific um, suggestions. This would, be, this, this would be recommendations to government agencies on how to solve those two problems you talked about? On a broader basis, yes. We're not going to uh, propose legislation, but on a broader basis, the things that we all can do, public sector, philanthropic sector, and private sector can do to help CDFIs do what they do better. So as far as fixing something very fundamental, this sounds like it's just more faster. Um, more faster? But there are uh, policy techniques that will take us a lot longer than here that I think can make us go faster. That was a good banker's answer to my uh, short response. Dan, thanks so much for joining us today. And thank you, Bank of America, for helping us make this happen. Thanks. <laughs>
Yeah, I think there's there's three major concerns that we're seeing with our with our alumni and our membership. One is that access to cash flow, right? Access to capital is always an issue, but with persistent supply chain challenges, the need to ramp up and really be competitive in the online space, that's a big issue of having the money to kind of put forward. We have many successful entrepreneurs who are in the targets and the Whole Foods, but there's a lag there in terms of payable, so that's one. I think the second thing is they are no less impacted by human capital. So very expensive staffing is leading to reduced margins, which is always an issue as well. Uh, and then I think the third piece is just managing the stress, uh, you know, the uncertainty. I think there's a huge emotional barrier that women and entrepreneurs of color carry in terms of pressure and what are you going to do and stress and access to capital, that this is just exacerbated during the season because for some of them, this really then sets the tone of where are they going for next year and where are they going for the next three years after they've invested such a significant amount in these businesses already. And when we look at the numbers, we know how much of the recent entrepreneurship is driven by women right. and people of color. Yes. Does it make a difference if they're a younger business owner, especially for managing stress? Do you think that that makes a difference? You know, I have six kids. I would say I don't think young people are managing stress any better. Um, and, and that's no disrespect, but I think what I find is a different kind of stress, right? For our older entrepreneurs, we tend to have, we kind of split them where they're like 45 and above and then like 30 or less. I think the 45 and above is a different stress because they've emptied out their 401ks, they've leveraged their house, and so it's a real financial stress to be successful. I think for the younger entrepreneurs, it's just pressure and success because people are saying, when are you going to get a job? What are you doing? They've taken that leap and they're there's not a huge safety net for them. So I think they're both stressed, but for different reasons. Um, I feel like, of course, we should say saying black and brown business owners is like saying the black and brown vote. Yes. <laughs> so yes. how do you advocate against kind of this one size fits all approach? Yeah, you know, I think it's important to note that everybody is different. And so we specifically have always been focused on black and brown entrepreneurs because they have a unique experience when starting their business. Data that I had the privilege to create when as a professor at Georgetown showed that black entrepreneurs spend at least a quarter of a million dollars more to start the same exact business as their white peer because of direct and indirect costs. So I think we try to do our best through data and research to say there is a difference. For example, 50% of all businesses fail within five years in the United States. Black businesses survive at least 8.9 years. However, the challenge is that does not correlate with revenue growth, nor does it correlate with increased access to capital. So let's break that down a little bit when we think about that gap, right? Because a quarter of a million dollars Not jump change. Um, for new majority business owners yeah. versus white peers. How do we start to close that gap? Well, I think it's important to parse out what that expense is, right? So one of those leading expenses, a direct expense, is that it's illegal to charge me more for a loan than it is to charge someone else in the audience because of perceived risk. The other is a set of indirect costs that we don't get into accelerators as often as other people do because they require a co-founder. When I started my first company, my friends were like, well, somebody got to have a job. I can't co-found this business with you. But not getting into these programs means I'm now paying market rate for lawyers. I'm paying market rate for accountants. I'm paying market rate for consultants. And then they're churning through those consultants four to six times more than the average person. So that's really what's causing the ongoing cost. Mm -hmm. And when we're thinking about access to capital, as we're seeing the economy tighten up, it's very natural that that credit will as well. That's right. So what is your message, especially to the bankers and the audience today, yeah. for when we're thinking about new majority business owners? Yeah. So having been a bank regulator uh, back in the day, um, I think one is to understand that not all risk is the same risk. And, and to not have a one size fit all and really think about what are the nuances and the algorithms you're using, whether they're technological or human, in terms of screening it, understand this cost difference and understand the, the travesty and, and the adversity that black and brown businesses, and you have to give that some weight and, and some accounting. I think the second thing is to be mindful of what are the opportunity costs? We tend to always talk about return on investment. What are the opportunity costs of not investing in these businesses? And then I would say that we know that, you you know, black and brown businesses and women entrepreneurs actually are much more efficient with capital. And so really, again, understanding what is that risk tolerance that you have in an institution is going to be important. What are the opportunity costs that are being lost? 
Well, I think one is that we know because of the lack of parity investing in black businesses, we've lost 1 million businesses that have not been created, which is $300 billion that could have been contributed to the economy. That's huge. If black businesses had been invested on parity with their white peers, we would have zero unemployment in places like the District of Columbia. So there is like a real economic cost to the country. I mean, City came out with a report and says racism has cost us $16 trillion by home ownership, by lack of access. <laughs> to capital, by business creation. And so it is fascinating to me because we use the term new majority because from a demographics perspective, black and brown communities are the fastest growing and in some states we are already the majority. And from an entrepreneurship perspective, we have been a 40 year decline in entrepreneurship post COVID, the fastest growing segment were women and entrepreneurs of color and to your point, particularly black women. So I think we've got to shift the frame that we're not talking about a minority marginalized group that has no impact on the economy, but we need to really reframe that there is an opportunity opportunity cost to these businesses, to job creation, to the country, if you continue to overlook this group of folks that are creating businesses and jobs at the fastest rate. I wonder, I wonder if we can talk about the role of the federal government in yes. all of this. Now that we know that control of Congress is split, yes. how optimistic are you about legislation like the Community Reinvestment Act being reinstated? 50-50. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've served in two presidential administrations. You know, I, I think in that case, it's really going to need to be the community saying this is why it's important. And so I'm, I'm semi-optimistic because I think there are some career people in there who have been advocating for a while. But I think we need to come back to data. I think that when I was in the Obama administration, there was a laissez-faire around, well, do we really need CRA and what's the impact? And I think with gentrification, there needs to be a redefinition of what is CRA because communities are not as homogenous as they used to be. So I'm optimistic that it's there, particularly people like Nicole and and the Bankers Association really pushing for that. I'm optimistic because I think on local communities, you're seeing the impact of not investing in certain areas. So I'll give it 50-50. And what do you feel like is, like what are we missing in terms of the story of what CRA does for communities? You know, I think, I think one is that it, it attempts to level the playing field. I mean, having been a CRA regulator, I think that we have to understand there's some nuances, right? So CRA is the score, the credit, credit score, I say, for the bank. But it looks at how banks disperse from a diversity perspective to oversimplify by grants, by loans and by investments. And I would say that there needs to be a little more punch or a little more carrot and stick around the loans and the investment because oftentimes we would see CRA grades go up because they gave a bunch of grants. But the reality is we saw that post George Floyd, a bunch of grants to black and brown entrepreneurs, what a great boost, but not going to help them with long-term sustainability. So I think we have to understand that we've got to really be more staunch in our advocacy around more loans and more investment. And I think it's important because during COVID, when the national average said we lost like 80% you know, of businesses and then 40%, we had a 95% survival rate amongst our over 5,000 alumni. And that's because we talk about the basics of cash flow, <laughs> savings, and having reserves. And so I think that there is evidence to say that black and brown businesses are worth investing in, that they have a different risk tolerance, but it is not reckless. And because of the majority, there is an opportunity cost to local communities, and there's an opportunity cost much larger than that. So how, what would that look like in D.C.? As you're saying, if you're thinking about specific communities, yeah. we talk about gentrification in the city all yeah. the time. What does community reinvestment look like for entrepreneurs, and what parts of the city are you most so I, I think, obviously, east of the river, particularly, massive development happening, but not seeing the growth of black businesses correlate with the growth of construction and home ownership. So I, I'm proud to say that we had the privilege to work with uh, a couple of local banks to provide grants, along with a lots of other grants that were given to black entrepreneurs in the District of Columbia. We said that was a way for them to recover and rebuild. And now we at 1863 have the privilege to be the administrator for the Venture Capital Fund for the District of Columbia. So DC has finally stepped up, as did Maryland and Virginia, and said, we're going to invest in historically marginalized businesses. So we've now given out two and a half million dollars. We have another two million dollars to give out. And that's specifically looking at entrepreneurs east of the river who have been historically disadvantaged because of COVID and or locked out of access to capital through CDFIs or traditional banks. I like you got. I like that you. Run, like, I love the cheering section. That is here we'll all morning. go for breakfast. I don't even know who That's they are. Good. Okay. That's great. Um, 
You know, you mentioned George Floyd. Mm -hmm. um, I was, we were at a, I was at a Zoom meeting for Axios earlier this week where we were talking about how much diversity was so much part of our conversation, especially the summer after George Floyd's yeah. murder. Do you feel like we have come to a fundamental shift in our society when it comes to recognizing systemic inequities? Or do you think everyone has kind of just forgotten about what we were talking about two years ago? I, I think we've forgotten, right? I, I mean, I think that it was a peak and it started to fall. Now, with all credit, I thought black people would no longer be popular by last Christmas. So we've extended it beyond what I expected. One more year. Uh, but but I think the data speaks to this. I was had the privilege to be in Austin yesterday at Afrotech, and there was a presentation by Samantha Tweedy with the Black Economic Alliance. And she noted that of all the $50 billion of commitments, 37% had been recognized. The rest had not. Of the 37% that had been recognized, 40% of them had not dispersed all their funds. So I think we have to be mindful that that peak happened, but respectfully, most of it was performative. It was around a press release. It was around how do I keep my employees happy? It was how do I not look bad? And so the dollars have not hit the street. And I think it's because there's a lack of accountability writ large in terms of what these companies were able to do. There was a public conversation around sure. accountability. What do you think that needs to look like now? Well, I mean, I think the way consumers have figured out how to demand for things to be green, we have got to figure out how do we align conversations around how do we demand that there's equity in the workplace, there's equity in investment, there's equity in spending. But I will say that, that I think the bigger challenge is we live in a capitalist society that thrives on competition. And there has not been an honest conversation, let me just say, within the black and brown communities to say, how do we come together? Because together we are powerful as opposed to being divided. Divided. If we start there and able to demonstrate the multiplier effect that happens when you equitably invest across everyone, then I think we begin to see the ROI that everyone is associated with the greatness of innovation in the United mm -hmm. States. Who convenes that conversation, you think? I think it's a set of multiple conversations. I think it's local community leaders. I think it's financial institutions. I think it's investors. I think it's academia. And then, you know, I was somewhat heartened uh, that we were back in person for Clinton Global Initiative. And people can say, yeah, it was good, it was not. But I will say this. Whether you believe in what he was as a president or not, I think what was interesting is the company showed up and were somewhat fearful of 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 not being there to say what I had attempted to do. So I do think that it needs to start locally and then there does need to be national places where there is a spotlight that it says, what have you done and how do we hold you accountable? And so every single session recognized the company that had. And for those companies in the room who hadn't, they were like, hmm, uh, okay. And then there was an awards around who had done what. And more importantly, there were examples. I do wanna give credit to CEOs, there's a lot going on. So I do think being able to provide case studies and examples and a pathway to follow, but now we've gotta get them to be willing to risk what be it their reputation, to say it is worth me going down this path. And what do you think needs to happen when it comes to establishing this cultural competency when we're thinking about capital or lending? Yeah. You know, I think people have to move out of fear. I think there's a lot of fear, again, caused by the, nature, the nature of competitiveness. Um, I think there's a lot of understanding. Uh, two years ago, we wrote a book, uh, well, a, a book, an e-book, uh, for investors and venture capitalists on how to invest in black founders, because I don't think they understood. Having data, being able to say, what is the difference? How do I need to adjust? I think we've gotten, in terms of access capital, that it's rote and it's algorithmic. That doesn't work when you're investing in people. I mean, it doesn't work for white folks. It certainly doesn't work for women, and it doesn't work for black or brown folks. And so I think we have to bring the human element back into how do we assess one's potential. Right. All right. Well, that's a great point, I think, for us to end on. Thank you. Thinking about the human element. And unfortunately, um, we are out of time. But Melissa Bradley, thank you for being with us. Thank today. you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And next, welcoming back to the stage, Axios Markets reporter, Courtney Brown. All right, hello again. Uh, our final uh, guest of the morning uh, comes from the White House. Uh, he's a member of the president of the President's um, Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Jared Bernstein. Yeah. 
Yes, again. Um, Is this a logic test? Yeah, we're going to judge. Whichever one of these you pick, we're going to judge you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, how are you feeling, Jared? I feel good. You feel good? I worked out last night, so uh, feeling pretty good. Um, I think maybe feel, people feel like they can feel a little bit good. We got a cooler uh, than expected inflation print. CPI, Consumer Price Index, came in at 7.7% year over year. That's really high far higher than the Fed, Federal Reserve's 2% target. But it's a slowdown. Are you feeling good about that? How's the White House feeling about that? Well, working to ease inflationary pressures is the president's top domestic priority. Um, he really did grow up in a family where the kinds of uh, challenges that uh, high price levels uh, uh, mean for families were kitchen table discussion issues. Uh, for him. Uh, so when we see uh, a deceleration, a slowing in the pace of inflation, uh, yes, we think that you're not going to get to where you need to go unless you're moving in the right direction, and that's a move in the right direction. Um, probably a little bit more analytically important there would be core inflation, which takes out the more volatile food and energy. Uh, and that uh, came in in October well below expectations, which is also important. You know, when, when a number like that comes in below expectations, it's a, you know, what they call a downside surprise. It suggests a bit more deceleration than people were expecting. I think from our perspective at the White House, um, we look at how our agenda is playing out in this slowing price growth and easing price pressures because it's such a, a high priority. It's so important to American families. And here we look at, we get under the hood and we look at goods inflation. We see our fingerprints, uh, our work on the supply chains, which really are kind of unsnarling. Uh, we look at food and energy. I mean, yes, the core is important, of course, for analysis for the Federal Reserve. Family's got to drive and eat, so we're looking at we're looking at that. We're happy to see uh, energy prices, gas, retail gas, uh, down a buck twenty-five off their peak from mid-June. And in fact, if you want to, we can get into a little bit of that kind of under the hood stuff on inflation. I think it's actually interesting and important. But that's how we approach that. Has inflation peaked? Is the worst behind us? You know, I really hesitate to talk about uh, peaks because. Uh, I think it's hard to know in this uncertain environment. You've got the war in Ukraine with its impact on critical, critical global commodities, particularly food and energy. You know, but if you look at the CPI and the PPI in particular, so sorry to get in the weeds right away, but uh, the producer price index came out yesterday. It was also cooler than expected. And, and if you look at uh, and that. Uh, shows the prices of goods that are uh, in the production process. So it feeds into the CPI. And as you and I were briefly discussing earlier, uh, the extent to which the PPI is leading the CPI is a bit accentuated now because firms have had more pricing power. So seeing the PPI way off of its most recent peak, seeing the CPI off of its most recent peak, yes, I consider this encouraging. Will I come out and, you know, the White House says inflation has peaked? I will not say that. Uh, I think there's just too much uncertainty in this climate. Uh, but again, the trend is our friend, and it's not just a, a, a monthly blip. We've seen a number of months of these improvements. Okay, because we did get a little bit of a head fake over the summer. It exactly. looked like inflation was slowing down meaningfully, and then no, that, that wasn't Correct. the case at all. Correct. Now, you know, again, okay, you've asked for it. I'm going to have to go into my inflation. Okay. Are we going to get nerdy? Okay. we got to go into the, into okay. the weeds. I hope you've had some coffee. Um, See, I think that uh, you're, you're exactly right, which is why I wouldn't say, um, you know, definitely inflation has peaked, although we do hear market analysts saying that. That's not uh, the White House message. What we're trying to do is connect our actions to what's going on with inflation. So if you look at uh, core goods inflation, so this is the stuff you might buy at Walmart or Target or Amazon, uh, taking out energy, so it's core goods. That's actually not just come down for a number of months. It was actually negative in October, so the price actually fell. Not just lower inflation, but a lower price um, <clears throat> in October. Uh, but that's been a trend. And the thing that I've done on my Twitter feed, if you want to see the graph, um, is uh, plotted that against the improvements in the supply chain. And, you know, it's correlation. Correlation, not causation. I did test for causation, and you can see some of that kind of in there. 
Um, but that's tracking the improvement in the supply chain. So the supply chain, based on this index that we look at, is 75% back to where it was. So it's, it's, it, w- you know, it, was, it was really snarled. It's 75% unsnarled. And you see the goods price coming down with that. Next look at shelter. Shelter prices, and this is the work of the Federal Reserve, the housing market has really cooled off with the Fed's hiking cycle. That tends to be the first sector that gets, uh, uh, that sh- feels that impact. We see home prices, rental prices rolling over. That takes six to 12 months to show up in the CPI because of the way it's constructed. You're getting kind of the marginal rentals, for example. They have to feed into the broader stock. Then you look at food and energy, which we, we can take apart. We see some improvements there. I mentioned the uh, decline in the retail gas uh, price. We can talk about food, where we've also seen uh, some steady slowing of the pace of inflation. Um, <clears throat> And then we talk about services, core services. And there's where you still see some pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that relates to the job market, which is really tight. And, you know, in Bidenomics, that's a really unequivocally good thing. The president has always, I've worked with him for a long time, and he's always recognized that a tight labor market is one of the most reliable ways to achieve the ultimate goal of Bidenomics, which is that if you're helping to bake the pie, you ought to get a fair slice. One channel by which that happens is through a strong labor market. There have been some signs of labor market cooling. Um, While we still have very robust job growth, it's not the breakneck pace that we saw in 21. So maybe there's some cooling there that could uh, uh, eventually roll over into services. But that part is still a pressuring point in the the inflation. So what does this all mean for the prospects of a a soft landing? Essentially, can the U.S. economy... Uh, avoid a recession? Well, sure. The, the answer to that question is, is yes, it can. Um, you know, sometimes, and uh, I, appreciate the way, I appreciate the way you frame the question, uh, because sometimes it's like, can you guarantee me that this or that will happen? Um, not in economics, actually not in anything. Um, so we live in a probabilistic world when you're talking about tomorrow um, or the future. Uh, and so, yes, there is a pathway to something that the president called months ago in an op-ed he wrote, a transition to steady, stable growth. What that looks like is what I've just been describing to you. So that, that nerdy decomposition you know, was hopefully instructive in that regard because it shows the path to slower and uh, to a steady and stabler growth. Um, you know, unsnarled supply chains, <clears throat> some pullback uh, in labor demand, seeing a little bit of that, uh, some um, uh, it, you know, improvement in the energy outlook, obviously, of food. Um, so we're seeing some of that. I think one thing to keep in mind, we had a, um, a strong retail sales report that just came out at 8.30 this morning. One thing to keep in mind is that the uh, American consumer um, uh, just keeps ticking. Mm-hmm. And consumer spending is 70% of this economy. So as long as that's in play, as long as the consumer's in play, even while she's pulling back some, understandably, while the consumer's in play, yes, the path to a, 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 a more steady, stable growth environment is definitely open. Things seem to look really good right now uh, as far as the economy is concerned, except for the really high inflation that we're dealing with, of course. But, um, you know... There are concerns that the economy will go into a recession next year. The Federal Reserve has been very aggressive. Um, I'm sure people in this crowd may or may not know. The moves that they make operate with a lag. So the full impact of them has has not hit the economy yet. So there are concerns about a recession next year. So how is the White House preparing for that prospect? Excuse me. Um, Really, which one of these should I drink? (laughs) <laughs> I think you should go with this one. <laughs> okay, again, I... Oh, maybe not. Which one has the poison? No, I... Uh, it's fine. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the things, uh, first of all, again, I think you've um, summarized things well, what, what you just said. You were saying the economy has, you know, some strong attributes. Prices are still, you know, too highly elevated. Every time the president talks about this, uh, there is nothing that would faintly resemble a victory lap. What we are saying is that some of the actions we've taken in energy markets, a little bit in food markets, uh, certainly when it comes to supply chains, are uh, you can see the fingerprints on some of the improvements in inflation, both in CPI and PPI. When it comes to, inf- uh, when it comes to you know, where growth is going, 
I think that the way to think about that is that there is a path to what we just talked about a second ago, transitioning from a really breakneck growth path uh, to something that's more steady and stable and you know, very much inconsistent with recession. So if you look, a, a lot of people, again, I, I, we're going way in the weeds for you know, 8.45 in the morning, but it can't be avoided. Um, a lot of people like to say in, in a, a recession is too quarters of negative GDP growth. You know, that's not true. The recession is actually officially um, uh, uh, designated as a as movements in, in a bunch of indicators that are more granular than that. And one of the key ones is payrolls. Mm -hmm. So payrolls have been really delivering the goods to the American working people. And they've been particularly strong. And I know we're talking about opportunity today uh, for persons of color. Um, we've seen some closure in some racial gaps. Uh, one thing that people don't know enough about, uh, and there's a CEA blog on this, is that the fastest wage growth, it's actually beating inflation, if you look at median wages, is, um, is for African Americans. Um, faster than, I mean, Hispanics are right up there too, um, but faster than whites. And so that's helping to, you know, close that gap. Now, I don't, you know, that has to go on for a long time before those gaps get uh, firmly closed. So I don't want to oversell it. But that is occurring. And one of the reasons that's occurring, because when the job market improves as much as it has, it disproportionately benefits lower uh, income uh, workers in their communities, uh, communities of color in particular. So I think with that kind of underlying momentum, again, the way I look at it is that the path to a, 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 a a growth path that's more consistent with trend GDP growth versus you know multiples of that which we were achieving in uh, in 21 is is very much open very much in play but not guaranteed so if there Nothing is a recession guaranteed. how is the white house planning for that prospect um what we're doing is trying to um double down on all of the positive uh improvements that you and i have talked about so Supply chain, 75% back to where they were. We'd like them to be 100%. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, okay? Implementing that is key. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, implementing that is key. The CHIPS Act, all of those create the kind of economic activity that will get us to the growth path that I've been describing as the optimal path that we're tacking for. Now, you're right. This is probabilistic. There are other paths that could come in. But the best thing we can do is implement the president's agenda, much of which, in some cases almost kind of miraculously to me, has been legislated. All those three bills I just mentioned, they're the law of the land. Um, yesterday was the one-year anniversary of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Uh, there are 7,000 projects totaling $185 billion in 4,000 communities across this country. I mean, if that's not insulation, if that's not the kind of um, uh, if that's not the kind of economic policy that helps tack towards that that middle path, then I, you know, I don't know what is. So I, that's what we're doing. You mentioned a bunch of legislation that you've been able to get through. Um, not me personally, but yes. You're right. The Biden administration. Sorry. Maybe Congress. you'll get a promotion after. If you take all the credit, maybe Thank I'll you. give you a promotion. Um, so and Congress. <laughs> give Congress. Uh, the Republicans are on the cusp of taking the House. So let's say there is a recession. You talk about how good the economy has been for minority communities, yeah. uh, disadvantaged workers. You know, if the economy goes into a recession, you know this, those are the people who get hit the hardest and first. So, I mean, what could you do to help people in terms of like dealing with a divided government? Is there anything you could do if that is the case to get legislation through that might be able to help people? Well, first of all, um, there's a lot of things that kick in, as you know, a lot of automatic uh, uh, safety net things that kick in if need be. And so uh, there's always that. I should also point out that in times of economic stress, the parties have come together and uh, um, uh, done uh, ha and passed uh, countercyclical uh, help. So you know that 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 option is out there. Um, but again, I feel like that is somewhat of a distraction relative to what it is that you know we've gotten as our marching orders from the president, which strike me not coincidentally. I mean, I know you think I'd say this, but I think he's right. Um, as spot on, which is to implement the measures that have been legislated on behalf of working Americans because we think that's the best way to make the transition to steady, stable, lasting growth with investments in clean energy. You know, the, um, 
The Inflation Reduction Act stands up a clean energy industry in this country that we've never seen before, uh, you know, with, with electric vehicles in particular and battery production. The CHIPS Act stands up domestic microchip production in here. And the bipartisan infrastructure law I just told you about, you know, the... Uh, the uh, 7,000 projects in 4,000 communities across the country. So that's rolling out as we speak. Implementing that is key. And I will get political, uh, as you suggested, even though it's not my natural you know, place to go as an economist. The president has said, if you want to work with us to efficiently implement those programs, if you have other ideas that will help achieve these goals, um, especially on behalf of working Americans and vulnerable communities. Um, he will work with you. He's shown that uh, time and time again. If your goal is to peel that back and to argue about, you know, the gender of Mr. Potato Head, you know, you're not going to find much of a partner with us on that. But if you want to work to achieve the kinds of economic goals, the kinds of economic path to a steady, stable transition, we are here to work with you. So you're a member of the CEA. The chair of the CEA, C.C. Rouse, is going back to Princeton in the spring. Uh, do you want to be the chair of the CEA? Uh, no comment on any future stuff like that. Um, I have found, I will say, you have, do you have given me a chance to talk about something I've never talked about before? Um, it has been so amazing to work with Cecilia Rouse, Chair Rouse. Uh, I learned so much about managing, about the combination of a big head and a big heart uh, and how to implement that in economic policy about working with a disparate set of components. So I hope she stays there forever, but I guess she probably has to go back to Princeton at some point. Okay. <laughs> I'll try one more time. Do you want that job, Jared? Yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to comment on that. Okay. Uh, so we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Well, it was a great conversation. Really uh, enjoyed it. Yeah, I hope you all enjoyed it too. Before you all go, please make sure to head to Axios.com for all of your post midterms news and subscribe to all our newsletters. You can subscribe to mine, Axios Macro. I'd really appreciate it. Um, and thank you again to our sponsor, Bank of America, um, and have a great morning.